Hey friends, it's Jay Rye. Thanks for coming back to the channel right here, Jay Rye World on YouTube and on Instagram. Today we have a very special episode. We're going back in time to the summer of 1990. Everybody was going crazy for the movie Dick Tracy, Warren Beatty, Madonna, Al Pacino. Oh my God, so many stars. Dustin Hoffman was in it too. And the movie did really well for its time. It was before the whole Marvel craze, before the DC craze with all the superhero movies we're inundated with. Now, why was this different? How did Disney get involved? How did Disneyland get involved with Dick Tracy? What was going on with Warren Beatty and Madonna? We're gonna talk about all of that starting right now. So before we get into everything that was going on in the summer of 1990 for the opening of Dick Tracy, let's talk about what happens today when you see a movie. By today's standards, you know when a movie is coming out months in advance, there's standees that are in the movie theater. There might even be elaborate displays in the theater that you're used to going to. You see commercials on television. You see billboards. There are all sorts of ways that movie companies are inundating you with choosing their movie when it comes out. And they want you to know about it so far in advance. Now, going back to the summer of 1990, this was a new concept. And Dick Tracy was one of the first movies to break that barrier of absolutely inundating you on all fronts that this movie was coming out. Now, who were the people behind that? It was Disney. Now, this was not a Disney movie in the sense of Walt Disney Pictures, like their animation division. This is more of an adult movie, Dick Tracy is, certainly with Madonna with her breasts popping out in the movie, absolutely. But what they did do, the genius of Michael Eisner, who was brought over from Paramount Pictures to help save Disney in the mid 80s, well, this was a big gamble when they did Dick Tracy. And here's a little special they did on the news talking about how Disney went all out in a different direction to show you how a movie can really be promoted. Check out how they described it here. This was the world premiere of Dick Tracy, a film Disney Studios hopes will be the blockbuster of summer 1990. The film cost a reported $30 million, and it said an equal amount was spent to promote it. At least a few of those bucks went to tonight's lavish party at Disney World. Warren Beatty plays Tracy in the film. He showed up, as did most of the rest of the cast, with one conspicuous exception. Madonna, we are told, isn't feeling well. But another Dick Tracy co-star did appear. Dustin Hoffman starred with Beatty in the ill-fated Ishtar, but he had only praise for their latest collaboration. If Warren had been a virgin all his life, they would have proclaimed him one of the great directors of our day. So what is Dustin Hoffman talking about there, saying if Warren Beatty had been a virgin, they would have respected his directing more? Well, that's because Warren Beatty's love life always inundated the press. It took over anything that he was doing because he was on the prowl constantly, dating many, many famous women, and even Madonna, who was in this film, Dick Tracy, was with Warren Beatty as well. Now, when we get back to this news story, it's gonna be very awkward as well because even Diane Sawyer admits that she dated Warren Beatty for a moment as well, and she is going to be interviewing him later in this episode. So. Stay tuned for that, but let's get back to uh, the initial news report talking about how movies were initially promoted. Promoting a movie used to be so simple. They'd have a fancy premiere in Hollywood, it'd be filmed for the newsreels, then the moguls would wait to see if the public liked what it saw. Take a film classic like Casablanca. The premiere was held in a New York theater, not even one of the big ones, and some of the stars didn't even bother to show up. He's looking at you, kid. There was no massive publicity campaign for Bogart, no frantic bidding for interviews with Bergman, no Casablanca t-shirts, raincoats, or sunglasses. Still, as time went by, the audience gradually discovered the movie and fell in love with it. Casablanca cleaned up at the box office and at the Academy Awards. But the age of discovery seems to be over. These days, the major studios launch an all-out assault to make sure you know about their movies before they come out. Way before. Somewhere along the line, Hollywood learned that even a mediocre movie, properly promoted, can make millions. And by now, every Joker knows it. 
I have to say this reporter is definitely taking license with his little jabs. Calling Batman a mediocre movie, I mean, even for 1990, Batman came back with Tim Burton, Danny Elfman doing the soundtrack, Kim Basinger, Jack Nicholson, Michael Keaton. That movie was a hit. That movie was not mediocre by any stretch of the imagination. So this guy's got to be a jerk. A full six months before Batman opened, slick trailers for the film hit movie screens, and the Batman symbol popped up everywhere. That got the public talking. Batman made $110 million, more than twice what it cost, in just its first 10 days. The Batman strategy proved that shameless promotion can be disguised as a fashion statement. They slapped that bat on a truly mouth-watering array of merchandise. Batman. Serious. Batman's producers earned almost as much promoting the movie as they did on the movie itself, more than a quarter billion dollars. So it's no surprise that the Dick Tracy logo is popping up everywhere too. The first wave of a summer-long invasion of everything from bullet bras to bedspreads. This sort of merchandising is a risky business. The last time they tried to market a Tracy toy, it vanished without a trace. Yep, there's another one of his jabs talking about merchandise. Interestingly enough, in the summer of 1990, the Dick Tracy merchandise not only was in the theme parks, but also they had it in the Disney stores, which were up and running at that point in many malls across the country. And there was a lot of Dick Tracy merchandise that was being sold there as well. So anyway, just listen to the agenda continue with this guy. <laughs> up antenna, switch on, press talk button, and you broadcast from room to room, and even house to house. The powerful, fully transistorized Dick Tracy two-way wrist radio is a real electronic instrument. Make sure all the fellows get their A-OK -okay Dick Tracy wrist radio so they can keep in touch. Over and out. Of course, this time, Tracy doesn't have just any old toy. He's got a boy toy. Whose side are you on? The side I'm always on. Mine. Promoting Dick Tracy is in Madonna's best interests, and not because Warren Beatty is her boyfriend. Open your heart to me. After a string of flop films, she needs a hit to prove she can be as big in movies as she is in music. Not that I need to defend Madonna, but there he goes again. After a string of flop films, she needs to... Oh my God, this guy is just... It seems like he's really jealous of the whole Warren Beatty thing. I, I, I don't know, I can't tell. But uh, the interesting thing about Madonna on tour in the summer of 1990 is she actually included Dick Tracy in her tour. So there was a guy in a Dick Tracy uh, trench coat uh, that would come out and she would do songs from the movie. Uh, the, there were many uh, big songs uh, that were in the movie that uh, were some actually really good hits. I, I really like her rendition of uh, Sooner or Later. Uh, Vogue was also on the Dick Tracy soundtrack. So, yeah, Madonna fully jumped in and understood how to use her tour as a marketing tool for this movie as well. I think everybody won in that regard. Madonna is aggressively promoting this film. A large portion of her current concert tour is devoted to Dick Tracy. Her new single is at the top of the charts, a single that's prominently featured on an album of music from the film. And the normally elusive rock star has been willing to strike a pose for just about every major media. No doubt about it, Dick Tracy is proving to be one arresting story. Since it began filming, there have been more than 900 stories done, just missing the record of 923 stories written about Batman before that film came out. And then there's Warren Beatty. In the past, getting him to sit down for an interview has been only slightly less difficult than getting him to the altar. But as the producer, director, and star of Dick Tracy, Beatty's prestige and a fair amount of his own money are on the line. So lately, he's become positively promiscuous with the press. Warren Beatty talking about life on the set of Dick Tracy with none other than Madonna. When I met her to talk about this picture, I found that I couldn't stay seated when I talked to her. Interestingly enough, she did. But I, I found myself pacing up and around the room because uh, the woman has an energy level that uh, is entertaining. entertaining. Come here. Uh, 
uh, Diane, Sam, I should tell you that while that piece has been rolling, uh, Warren Beatty's been listening to it and he wasn't very happy. So let's give him a fair shot. Very- I was literally dying when the reporter who did that whole piece had to like face the music with Warren Beatty standing right in front of him. And he literally comes back on when they're live and says, oh, he wasn't very happy. Well, yeah, of course he wasn't. You're making all these snide remarks the whole time about him and his girlfriend at the time, Madonna, and all of these little sexual innuendos and everything like that. Now, if you ever look up contentious or contentious interview, uh, this would be the epitome of it. Like this, watch what happens when now uh, Warren Beatty gives it right back to that reporter, and this is live. And then, of course, the other uh, anchors, uh, Diane Sawyer, who, as I mentioned earlier, Warren also had a relationship with, uh, and Sam Donaldson even gets into the mix. So you want to see the awkward of all time, grab the popcorn. Here we go. And he wasn't very happy, so let's give him a fair shake. Damn, Sam. Sir? Uh, can you hear me? How are you? Hello, let's, how are you? Oh, sorry, sorry. Let's, let's be fair yes. here and say that the people you, who saw the film tonight yeah. loved it. And uh, so th- there's a good review right there. Hats off to Dick Tracy. Well, that's good. Uh, did you feel that we were a little too tough on you there? Uh, do you want me to talk to that? Yeah, to that camera right there. I don't think you're tough. You're, you're almost as tough on us as they were on you on Primetime Live. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You think we'll do as well? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Um, you know, uh, Mr. Beatty, you have been famously uh, uncomfortable in dealing with the press and promoting your films, and uh, you have been doing a lot of interviews now. Is, is this tough on you? I, I, no, it's not tough on me. I'm having, this is as much fun as you can have and still have your clothes on. <laughs> yes. Uh, you know, the, the press keeps dealing with questions about your personal life. Uh, yes. Does, yes. Does that make you uncomfortable? Are you? No. Do I look uncomfortable to you? Well, I guess maybe a better question then would be to ask yes. you whether you feel you're portrayed accurately in the media. Oh. I, I mean, for I, example, I, let me give you an example. Yeah. This, this Most is, of the recent interviews yeah. have uh, portrayed you as being very cautious in what you huh. say, very cautious yeah. about answering anything. Yeah. Uh, why is that? Why is that? Well, I don't know. Uh, I, I thought I was going to get to talk to Sam and Diane. We're talking. Diane's there, Diane. Hi, Diane. Hello. Hi. How uh, are you? Uh, I, it's a funny atmosphere to talk personal questions in. Are you used to speaking personally in this atmosphere? Let me ask you. Let me ask yes. you. Can you hear me, Warren? Yeah. Yeah. Do you need? Does a movie really need all of this publicity these days? Does it need this kind well, of? Well, I opening? thought we were just. I thought we were just making a movie, you know, about a guy who was sort of forgotten, you know, a, a classic old American comic. Uh, uh, character Dick Tracy and I was surprised that uh, I, I'm amazed uh, you know about a, a month ago everybody was saying that nobody would come and now I'm I'm kind of surprised I mean this is quite amazing I'm impressed by the Disney people but is the is the moral of the story that it really needs this can you just launch a movie the old-fashioned way anymore the old fa- is this the old-fashioned way I have no idea I mean this is my idea of, of real confusion <laughs> I, I should ask uh, Warren because a lot of people were wondering where Madonna is tonight. Everybody was uh, well, waiting for her. Well, Madonna is on tour, and she has been asked not to speak for 48 hours by her doctor. She's got a bad, bad throat. She's uh, getting pretty good, good notices in this film. She's not getting pretty good notices. <laughs> She's getting very good notices. <laughs> <laughs> I'm no critic. You're, I'm a correspondent. You're not even a correspondent. <laughs> Unless, of course, in some divorce trial. Well, Dick Tracy got his man again. I guess that's it from Florida. Very good. <laughs> All right. I don't know whether yes. the two of you should try taking this on the road or not. I think I think we better close this. Let down. me ask you. You're going to take prime time live on the road because I, this would be a good idea for you. This you should is come down I'm... here. You should come down here and let these Disney people get behind prime time live. I can't stop laughing at how many times that Warren Beatty absolutely zinged that reporter and that's why i even put the bells in there for you in case uh you know just make it stand out more for you how many times he just kept laying it to him and even with the sexual innuendos i understand that this was 1990 and you really weren't talking like that on television but he was being very risque um and really pushing the envelope to make the network uncomfortable here's what was really funny also why i stopped at this point he makes a comment, Warren Beatty makes a comment to Diane Sawyer saying, 
you should get the Disney people down here to get behind your show and they would really do something amazing with it. Funny enough, Disney acquired ABC about six years after this. So at this point, Disney did not own a television network. Nowadays, you see all the Disney promotion and everything really heavily done on ABC because they own it. Uh, but back then, they did not. So maybe uh, Warren Beatty was telling the future a little bit here. Anyway, let's get back to the end of this little awkward interview. Here we go. Diane. Warren. Yes, sir. Warren, by the Warren way, Beatty, go, we, yeah. we thank you, I Diane, think. Diane, just yes. ask me to answer me one question. One question. Do I look older than Eddie Murphy? <laughs> now, who has is, who is alleged such a shocking thing? All right. Sam, how come I don't hear from you? Sam, Sam, is too where are Sam you? has changed his name and left town. Sam Donaldson, where are you? Why do you not participate in you this? You look much younger than Sam Donaldson. You feel no, I'm not sure. presidential, Sam? Are you going to run for president, Warren? There's a story Sam, that... Sam, you're now asking the There's question. a story that when your friend Gary Hart got in trouble with a woman, yeah. you thought, well, I can't run for president now with my record. Is that right? Sam, you came up with the goods right away. <laughs> you're, you're a prince, Sam. You're a prince, like the night I saw you at Lucy's. Now let him figure think, out where Lucy is. I think what? we've I think we just this had a confusion coup with this interview. I think confusion is the mildest thing to be said about this right now. We thank you, Warren. Sure enough, we do. And we thank you, Judd. Don't stay up too late down there. Wow, I know that interview had a lot of people curling their toes, but uh, I don't I was laughing the whole way through. I thought it was, you know, freaking hilarious. They just uh they just kept trying to poke the bear and they certainly uh they certainly got his paw in the end. Um, and you notice at the end there that, uh, yeah, they just cut his feed because they did not know where else Warren Beatty was going to go with it. Uh, and, you know, rightly so. But that was how they conducted the premiere, you know, and they did live television for it. And again, it was a really big spectacle. They held it down at the uh, Disney MGM Studios in Orlando. Now, that park at that point, by the summer of 90, it was only one year old. But it was exactly what Michael Eisner was planning. He wanted to have lots of events happening at the Disney MGM Studios. He started a full animation studio down there as well. He wanted to shoot movies down there in Florida as well. It was a big move to you know, outdo the Orlando version of Universal Studios. And they went all out. And having this Dick Tracy premiere there and these live TV cuts and everything like that were all part of the master plan to blitz the world with Dick Tracy coming to theaters. Now, Madonna took a very different tack with her interviews. Obviously, she's a very different person than Warren Beatty. So she did an entire special on MTV, which was perfect for her because it tied in her music career and because she was in charge of the soundtrack for Dick Tracy and did the whole I'm Breathless album. She had a lot to talk about with MTV about Dick Tracy. Now, of course, uh, Kurt Loder was the interviewer from this 1990 interview, and he was talking to her and, of course, going right there with the relationship with Warren Beatty as well. So it's interesting to see her reaction and how she handled it, which I feel is just in typical Madonna fashion. She was very suggestive, playful, but also, uh, you know, kind of pushing him away at the same time. So anyway, take a look at this. This is uh, Madonna, MTV, talking about Dick Tracy. Dick Tracy, he had the perfect girlfriend to test. He had the perfect job. Until the mob found the perfect weapon. Breathless Mahoney. With Dick Tracy in the crew. Do I have to do it? Now, the next move he makes. Just don't ask me to like it. Could be his last. Trust me. She does some nifty undercover work. Warren Beatty is Dick Tracy. Coming soon to a cinema near you. Well, the new thing is. This is because Warren Beatty did this interview. With Barbara Wallace, the real turtle. But he did this interview. And he said he wants to have kids too. And I just, well, naturally the question would arise, you know, would you be having them together in France? Well, I just really can't comment on that. <laughs> I thought I had to try. I don't know. Uh huh. Is there, is there a different sort of sort of persona in the, in the songs for Dick Tracy and the film also? I mean, is it a new Madonna? It's not, well, it's inspired by the movie, so yeah. it's kind of in character. My breath is character. Yeah. Okay. 
Hello? You're breaking and entering, you know. Sit down. I think Lips Manless is dead. And I want you to tell me who killed him. Or maybe you weren't on his side. Whose side are you on? Side I'm always on. Mine. No grief for Lips? I'm wearing black underwear. You know, it's legal for me to take you down to the station and sweat it out of you under the lights. I sweat a lot better in the dark. I know how you feel. You don't know if you want to hit me or kiss me. I get a lot of that. Look, you're safe. Big boy's in jail. You're the one that can keep him there. Give me a call. The first song in the show is... Um, a scene that's on her song, and then the other two I wrote, trying to keep in the period vein with the sort of modern yeah. feel to it. So, and but there's I don't know, 12 songs in the soundtrack. Mm -hmm. Is it the album that I'm going to be like all stuff like that with Tracy or what? Well, some of the songs are in the movie, the rest are just inspired by the movie itself, mm -hmm. the period aspect, the cartoon aspect, the gangsters, you know, the characters, and and who I was in the movie. Yeah. My student song by him said, it's a great song, I feel a long time you know. I know I'm now, I didn't really, I knew who he was before I did the movie, but I was introduced to him and worked with him. And, yeah. You know, I really respect him. What attracted you to this? Were you going to be Tracy? Yeah. What attracted me to it? Yeah. A good part in the movie. Yeah. I mean, a chance to look at a lot of great talent. Yeah. Does it, is it, does it resemble, you know, like blondes you've done previously? No. Like, who's that it, girl? No. Like? This movie looks like nothing in here. In what way? It's just like with looks. Like that, you know, it just oh. looks incredible. More. It's like a 3D cartoon, but it's real. You can think of Jesus and do it. <laughs> plug, plug, plug. Okay. And now I have to eat my breakfast. It was short, and there certainly weren't a lot of incredible details there, but what Madonna did key in on, which I think is so important when you look at the movie Dick Tracy, is that it is like a 3D comic book. We're so used to, by today's standards, the Marvel Universe and the DC Universe, but Dick Tracy was on his own back then, and it was very different. The only movie that was right before it was uh, Tim Burton's Batman in 89. And when Dick Tracy came out in 1990, the colors, the exaggerations, the villains' faces, you know, it was like, it was really over the top, but it was just like, it was, it was such excitement for your eyes. And uh, yeah, Madonna did touch on that a little bit. And her going on television to talk about this movie was another part of this giant blitz that you really hadn't seen before when people were promoting movies. This was really pushing the boundaries. So we've talked quite a bit about Madonna and Warren Beatty, and we've talked about the soundtrack and Madonna doing it. Let's actually hear from the soundtrack. This is one of my favorite cuts from the movie, and it's actually cut with pieces of the movie. This is Madonna, Sooner or Later. Oh 
Now, another way that this blitz was taking full effect was that Dick Tracy was featured at Disneyland and at Walt Disney World in the theme parks, which was shocking. You know, the theme parks at that time were still very animation driven and they didn't have a lot of adult type of content. They were starting to ramp up because in 1986, they added Captain EO. 1987, they added Star Tours, which is, of course, based off of the Star Wars franchise. And then, in the summer of 1990, Dick Tracy got his own stage show. They had photo locations all in the area back by Videopolis, just, uh, just to the side of Small World in the back of Fantasyland. Dick Tracy took over this whole area, and that was unheard of at the time. You could take your pictures with these lineups during the day. They had the stage show, which was called Dick Tracy and the Diamond Double Cross. They had the Ice House, which was a little place where you could buy snacks. My friend Nick worked at the food location here with the giant Dick Tracy logo. As you can tell by the decorations, they didn't spend a lot of money on it, but Dick Tracy was absolutely represented. Now, let's get to the actual stage show. I filmed the entire stage show on an old-fashioned camcorder back in the day. So let's take a watch right now. It's Dick Tracy and the Diamond Double Cross. This is on the Fantasyland stage, which back then was called the Videopolis stage. And here we go. Mahoney. In just 15 minutes, there's going to be a show here called Diamond Double Cross, starring my favorite cop, Dick Tracy, along with some of my other friends and enemies. I think you're going to enjoy yourself. I know I will. I always do.
Gracie. With a clue and a Tommy gun. Third time this week. I'm sorry. I heard you're working a little too hard, Tracy. I worry about you. I know you do, Tess, but somebody's got to clean up this city. And you're the man to do it. Well, an evening together at Mike's Diner is better than nothing. I'm glad you feel that way, Tess, because there's something I've been wanting to ask you. Yes, Tracy. Tess, you and I. Go on, detective, go on. Tracy, I'm crazy for you. What I'm trying to say is, Come on, Tracy. don't you think it's about time that we... Calling Dick Tracy! Calling Dick Tracy! The Melonian diamond has just been stolen from the museum! Calling Dick Tracy! I'm on my way. Tess, I gotta go. Where? To the Club Ritz. Call it a hunt. The Club Ritz? I call it dangerous, Tracy. Danger comes with the territory, Tess. I'm used to that. Right. I'll be back. Tracy!
So far, so good. I didn't say anything about being good. But perhaps the good detective would like to join me for a quick dance. I don't dance. That's okay. I'm a hot teacher. It is getting warm in here. So wouldn't you like to learn how to move? I'm on duty. What a coincidence. So am I. Shut up, shut up. 
Ain't no diamond here. Wrong, big boy. It's right here in this room, and I know who's got it. One you mean, Tracy? Big boy, you've been double-crossed. I thought I recognized you. Big boy, meet the mistress of disguise, arch-villainous, Crewy Lou. Oh, you got me this time, Tracy. You were clever, Crewy, but not clever enough. You signaled your accomplice too many times. Accomplice? Flat top. He didn't drop that diamond off the rooftop. He passed it to Crewy Lou. Nice going, Crewy! Boys, lock him up. Uh, uh, Dick, Dick, mind if I call you Dick? Listen, Dick, I didn't steal the diamond. I mean, I stole the diamond before, but back the white goes, there's ain't no break! Well, I guess this means your dance lesson will have to wait. There isn't going to be a dance lesson, Breathless. Well, then. 
I guess this is goodbye, Dick. I have two questions. Breathless, why would a beautiful woman like you get mixed up in a racket like this? Well, Tracy, I guess I'm just a material girl. And my second question. Tess Trueheart, will you marry me? Oh, Tracy, I thought you'd never ask. I've been waiting in every time. I'm on my way. Tess. I know. Don't get it, Tracy. Tess, I want to tell you something about it. It's always here to answer our call. It's the only man who could help us. The greatest part of them all. Call it Dick Tracy. It's far. Wow, watching back this show 30 years later, it's so bad. <laughs> I mean, okay, let me, let me say that again. It's so corny, but um, it was really a huge moment in time because Disney was just starting to figure out, hey, let's make some stage shows. Let's keep people's literal butts in the seats longer in the theme parks, promoting other brands. Uh, this Dick Tracy uh, show was in the summer of 90. They also had uh, One Man's Dream, which was an amazing stage show that they created. It then bled into uh, Beauty and the Beast, which was another stage show that lived on this Fantasyland theater in uh, Disneyland, California. And this actually was the start of an entirely new division for the company of theatrical shows. It ended up creating, uh, you know, uh, Beauty and the Beast, uh, Lion King, Mary Poppins, uh, and other shows that they took on the road and traveled worldwide. I mean, including, of course, Broadway in New York. So even though this Dick Tracy show was maybe not quite ready for prime time with the, some of the jokes and some of the silliness, uh, but you know what? 
I really got what they were trying to do. They really were, again, just assaulting you from all different avenues so that you knew this movie was coming out and hopefully you'd buy a ticket and buy a yellow fedora uh, or anything else that they had to offer. And speaking of which, uh, let's take a look at some of this merchandise uh, as we come to the end here. All right, so you can see here there is a Dick Tracy and a Breathless Mahoney coffee mug, which is cut uh, your drinking out of their heads. Not bad likeness of uh, both of them. Here's promotional posters they made of a lot of the big characters with uh, little uh, slug lines under them, little quips. Uh, the Crime Stoppers print kit. I can't imagine this sold a lot. I think it was meant for kids, but the movie ended up, of course, not really being a kid's movie after all. The poncho, the Dick Tracy yellow poncho. Dick Tracy suspenders. Don't know how many of those they sold either. The action figures. Now, these were very popular. I was working at the Disney store at the time, and the action figures were a big deal, and especially people wanted the blank. As you can see in this photo, they kept him wrapped up. Uh, or her, spoiler alert, um, because the blank ended up becoming uh, very valuable. Uh, the two-way two -way wrist watch, which was a uh, mail-in prize you had to get. Uh, the his and hers grooming kits which came with a watch. Um, and then the premiere t-shirt. Now, I had one of these because I did go to the midnight screening uh, in, um, in Costa Mesa, actually, at uh, Hutton Center. I remember that. And uh, it was a lot of fun going to see the movie uh, first, right, with everybody across America. Loved the movie. And uh, I don't know where this T-shirt is anymore, but uh, I, did, I did have one at one point. So, right. So the whole point of this episode is to have some fun, have some memories about a movie that's kind of forgotten, Dick Tracy. You know, over 30 years ago, this movie came out, and it was a spectacle, and it does deserve to get a little bit more credit, you know, than it does today. Everybody today is wrapped up with, you know, the Avengers and Iron Man and Batman and, and worrying about who's going to be the next star playing it. But if you go back, Dick Tracy on its own merits was a really great movie. So give it another watch when you have time. Anyway, this is Jay Rye. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for checking out the channel. It's Jay Rye World right here on Instagram and on YouTube. Check out all the Disney episodes that are in the playlist or whatever else makes you happy. All right, we'll see you next time.